Okay, so thank you very much for coming. Um, I have to say a few housekeeping things. The toilets are out there. If there's an earthquake, stay where you are until the shaking stops and then see what happens next. <laughs> and if there's a fire, there are four exits and the exits out through the door there and basically to the car park if there are lots of flames off. Now, um, I don't, well I'll introduce myself, I'm Simon Pollard and my background's really on spiders, that's, that's been my career working with spiders. Um, and yet I've also been involved in a lot of um, public understanding of science through uh, writing and photography and advising on documentaries and writing books. And, um, and so t tonight's a sort of talk a bit about you know, how to tell the difference between science and pseudoscience. As a scientist that's relatively easy for me to do, but for a lot of people it's difficult and you get bombarded with um, what looks like real science and it's just garbage. So, but the thing is that we, we bring a lot of baggage ourselves and I want to talk a bit about that first and give you some examples of um, just fantastic science. Um, fantastic natural history stories that I've been involved in in the last year. I was working in Wellington for two days a week with Tapapa and Weta Workshop on a big exhibition on bugs and so I had a chance to find out stories that I didn't know existed. So what is science? And, and this is really worth reading carefully because it really does define what science is compared to other things. And we do sort of rely on the laws of nature. We're pretty confident the sun will rise tomorrow. We're pretty confident gravity will be, work gravity will be working tomorrow. But it's not an absolute. But it's not, it's not a, there's no point in worrying about it. And this is a lovely quote from Galileo, you know, that wanted people to understand that, that nature not only gave them eyes to see who works, but brains to make them capable of understanding. And that's what it really boils down to us. We have, we have brains capable of understanding the world around us. And, the, and that changes very, very quickly. If we look at our brain, you know, somebody said that the human brain is the most amazing thing to ever have evolved in the universe, but you have to be careful because you guess who told us that. Um, and you look at our closest living relative, which is the chimpanzee, we're just worlds apart. You know, there's just no comparison in what, what we're capable of of understanding our world compared to them. And I just want to put some of that science and technology in perspective. This is an example of an early hominid. Um, <laughs> it's, it's actually me in 1978 collecting spiders up on Cass. And this is our closest living relative. This is in, in rainforest in Uganda, and I would never get close to a chimp in the wild like that but they ate something that made them stoned. So they just sat in the tree staring straight ahead. So this was just taken with a point and shoot. The thing is, the next slide, what's really important about the slide is it's taken in 1961 in November. It says two things. It says how different we are from our closest living relative and our ability to understand science and technology. And it's also a photograph of the first hominin going into space. And it wasn't us. It was a chimp. And we had no fears that the chimps would turn around and send one of us into space. <laughs> you know, but if we'd, done, if we'd nicked a Russian and popped them on the thing, that may not have had such a good outcome. And chimps are, of course, outraged. That is actually a, that is a chimp um, skull. And this is the first, this is Ham, who went up and came down. It must have been terrifying for an animal that's never ever been accelerated at that speed up into space. This guy, Enos, was the second chimp to go into space and he was meant to circle the Earth three times. And something went wrong and he was getting, he was meant to be rewarded but he was actually getting small electric shocks. But he continued doing the right thing. And so they, they bailed it out and he came down um, into the sea and it was an hour and a half before they could pick him up because it was, they weren't predicting he'd land there because of cutting the orbit. And the thing is he wasn't a social ch chimp. He had mu very much one owner. But when he was picked up and taken out onto the boat, onto the ship, he ran round the deck shaking everybody's hand because he was so <laughs> pleased to be back on land. <laughs> this chap sort of paved the way, Sam was a rhesus monkey. 
He went up and came down, survived. He lived to 1982. He went up in 1959. And I think it is the first space onesie I've ever seen. <laughs> so going back to our brains, you know, absolutely extraordinary what we're capable of. And to think that only eight years after that photograph was taken, people walked on the moon. And at that stage, they couldn't walk in the deepest ocean, in the marina, bottom of the marina trench. But they had the technology to go to the moon and come back. And they were calculating things on the trajectories, etc., to land using a slide rule. Now, the thing, the thing with people, though, is we come, as I say, with sort of historical baggage from our evolutionary past. It's only very, very recently that um, we've started to understand the world in the way that we do now. Maybe 500 years? You know, there were tinkerings of it, but it's such a short time. And so our brains, the, sort of, the big bang of, of consciousness in our brains happened about uh, 40 or 50,000 years ago. It's a tiny, tiny amount of time. And so we sort of have this combination of this, not primitive brain, but a brain that wasn't didn't evolve to do science. And I just want to tell you about some of our baggage. You know, one of the things we do is we have a propensity to see things and then attribute causation to them. This is actually upside down, this picture, but it was taken in 1976 by the Viking on Mars. You see the face? People were saying there's a, there's a colony on Mars, it proves it. It's just like they designed their buildings with great faces. We see faces, you know, we can't help it. And we do, and we sometimes attribute meaning to faces, especially, you know, religious people see somebody on a piece of toast and it's something <laughs> divine. We see terrifying things in the fridge. <laughs> and this tendency to see faces, uh, you have to look at this. This is Google Deep Dream. So they've taken these algorithms that look for faces just like we see them. And the more and more you do it, the more bizarre it gets. So that's taking those two jellyfish and just applying that algorithm to them. We also, this superstition is a big part of our existence. We are superstitious people. We believe things that just don't make sense because, it, because we want to make a relationship. We want to be able to talk to people if they're dead. We want to believe in ghosts. I do, this is a Charles Adams cartoon. I think it's a great cartoon. It's somebody brushing their teeth, but they're not there. Um, in fact, there were, spiritualism was very popular in the US about 100 years ago. And there was a very interesting article where there were two key spiritualists. And one of them was terminally ill and died. But they said to the public, if he can, he'll talk to me from the other side and I'll report what he said. Now, obviously, that's very easy to fake, but she never did. She never said, well, of course he didn't call. Now, I know, that's just scary. Um, that has nothing to do with supernatural things, but it's just some people are scared of clowns, and I think that's a really scary clown. <laughs> you know, theories in the bottom of the garden. This, this was 1930s. I mean, it looks so fake, but people believed it. Um, I can't remember if it was Arthur Colin Doyle. Somebody went round to the gardens to see if they could see the fairies, and people saw fairies. Even though they weren't there, they saw fairies. This is a woman you don't want to mess with, um, Maud Gong. She was a wealthy English woman and um, lived in Ireland. And nobody ever commented about the fact she had starlings in a hat. Um, but what she did was she had a child who died at two and was buried in a very elaborate mausoleum in Ireland. And two years after the child's death, she convinced her ex-husband to go down into the mausoleum and have sex next to the dead child because she believed his soul would go into her new child. And she did have a baby nine months later and it was a girl, not a boy. Now, what is faith? You know, we all have different levels of faith. And it really is magical wizard source. <laughs> Mates just do this. And we all do it at some level. Just some people do it more than others. And you've got to watch out for... Pegasus feces as well. And, you know, the good thing about science is that it's true whether you believe in it or not. And I want to just talk about a few things. This is a very nice quote. You know, it's not seeing new landscapes, but having new eyes. And I think in recent history, in the last 150 years, this man did more of using new eyes to understand our world. 
Because up until then, people had a very different world view of where they came from and what their relationship was to other animals. And he sort of said, well, no, this seems to be what's going on. And in, in 150 years since, we've only reinforced that view. Of course, he wrote Origin of Species. And he was ridiculed at the time because Victorian England was a very religious place. And, you know, it is the tragedy of the great artist, of the great scientist, that he frightens the ordinary man. And so Darwin was seen as an ape. They had this view that evolution or the world resulted in humans. I'm sorry I haven't got a laser pointer. Uh, result, you know, it was a tree that went up to the top and humans were the, at the top. And now we know it's not like that at all. It's much more like a sort of floating sea lily of all these radiating parts, different types of life. And these are actually colourless monkeys in uh, West Uganda just sitting in a tree. And, you know, we are closely related to some things and less related to other things, but we all share common ancestors. This was taken in Sarawak in Borneo and I was looking for spiders and this orangutan came down out of a tree with its baby and went over to get one of my cameras and I went over there and then she went off and got my can of Pepsi, drank the Pepsi, filled it up with water and went back up the tree. <laughs> Biodiversity is so extraordinary and you know, Entomologist and evolutionary biologist Haldane was asked by a religious person what had a lifetime's work told him about what his creator was up to. And he said, well, he had an inordinate fondness for beetles. Because <laughs> there's four out of five species on Earth are beetles, and one in ten is a weevil. And there's about 350 discovered, but I think it's a lot more now. And this is my pet weevil, Frank, telling me that. I had a pet weevil for a while until I accidentally stood on him, which felt very good. <laughs> Now, you know, Adam and Eve, this is Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Um, yes, you know, for a long time that was accepted that the world started with two people, Adam and Eve in the Garden of um, Eden. And it went on from there. And I think we have a pretty good sense that, yeah, these are great stories and they are important to people, but they're outside the realm of science. We're not out there to, we can say, well, no. It was evolution of life on Earth, not two people were created 4,000 years ago. The idea of Noah's Ark is a fantastic story. Um, yeah, so much for the unicorns. And I, I do believe that, and, you know, we do deal with people. I mean, there was a Noah's Ark Museum open recently in Kentucky. That That is true, that all the animals on Earth were carried on a boat for 40 days during extremely bad weather. And um, I, I think that if the Bible had been written in the Amazon rainforest versus a desert where the biodiversity is much less, you would not have had Noah's Ark as a story, because you can just imagine even getting the ants on board Noah's Ark. People believe that dinosaurs and humans coexisted. We have a pretty good idea they didn't. Um, and this guy, you know, I'm not here to, 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 to dump on religion at all, I'm just saying that when when religion interferes with science, it doesn't go well. This chap saying, basically, the Bible's literate. Anything that says in the Bible, if it said 2 plus 2 equals 5, I have to believe it. The unfortunate thing with this guy is he teaches biology in a religious college in the States. Teach the controversy. You know, somebody have said, as more and more fossils are found, because each year, each week, each month, you read about more fossils being found. Religious explanations, the devil's planting them. Well, that's just not useful. Um, and, and it's only because science threatens people's religious security or the spiritual security that they will attack science in this way. Not with any meaningful suggestion of what science is, but just to attack it. And, you know, look at this. Product of evolution, product of intelligent design. <laughs> And I think we'd probably, most of us would agree that most of the greatest evils that man has afflicted upon man have come through people feeling quite certain about something which in fact was false. I want to talk a little bit about some of the issues we have with understanding both geological time and the size of the universe. And I, I mean, we all struggle. We can go back a hundred years, we can look at pictures of relatives and great grandparents and whatever, but you start to go to a thousand or a million or hundreds of millions of years or a billion years, it just it means nothing. 
all this does is put in perspective how long we haven't been here and how long other things have. And this is an American toilet roll. And it's 40 metres long. They're about twice the length of a New Zealand toilet roll for whatever reason. <laughs> and this has 400 sheets, individual sheets, and each one represents 12 and a half million years. The, the point is, all of human recorded history for the last 10,000 years is 0.1 of a millimetre on the end of the roll. And the dinosaurs go extinct. 65 million years ago, five squares from the end. And what I like, you know, you look at first Homo sapiens about the last millimetre, 100,000 years ago. If you take the last thousandths of a millimetre, then that's the last 100 years. And, you know, think back to 1917. So this is enormous thing that we just can't get our heads around, but it has allowed animals to do some pretty remarkable things, and plants. You know, most of our ancestors were not perfect ladies and gentlemen, the majority weren't even mammals. <laughs> and this is the last um, sentence in Origin of Species, and I want to give you some examples from so simple a beginning, Enus forms most beautiful, most wonderful being, and are being evolved. And these examples really rely on the fact that we have the technology to answer some of the questions about what these uh, animals can do, where we couldn't have even 10 or 20 years ago. This is a kiwi, and this is an elephant bird, which is an extinct moa looking like thing from Madagascar. Recent DNA work has said the closest relative <coughs> of the kiwi is the elephant bird in Madagascar, not moas. In fact, Moas are related to a pheasant-like thing that lives in South America, and kiwi are more closely related to emu and cassowary in Australia than they are to moa. And they think that they had a common ancestor that lived in the lush rainforests of Antarctica about 50 million years ago. And that, that, the, that, that ancestor ended up flying to Madagascar and flying to New Zealand. Very different thing from what we have an idea of what happened. And this is not, you know, a wild, what's wild speculation may be exactly when it happened and what did Antarctica, when in Antarctica. But the question is, look, looking at the DNA of both these species, they know these guys are close cousins. As I mentioned earlier, I was very fortunate last year to have this two days a week in Wellington for a year working on this big bug show. And I just want to tell you some of the stories, just astounding natural history stories. This is an orchid mantis. And when it, was first, when it was first written about and in the late 1800s, somebody excitedly wrote back to Australia and said, I've just found a flower that eats flies. <laughs> and then they said, well, no, no, it's, um, it's actually a uh, praying mantis that looks like a flower. So people said, oh, it looks like a flower, so it's camouflaged so that pollinating insects won't see it and they'll get eaten. Well, in the last few years, and this is the model realised by Weta Workshop for the show, no, it's not camouflaged, it's a super attractive flower to insects, to pollinating insects. They prefer to go to the praying mantis than a real flower. And, and what's allowed that story to be told is that people now understand how pollinating insects see the praying mantis. And Weta have done with showing different lighting. And the result is the same, that you fly to a flower if you're a pollinating insect and you get taken out by these things. It's a wonderful story. One of the things that Charles Darwin struggled with in a very religious society is how could anybody come up with parasitic wasps? Because they're so insidious. And this is just outside the kitchen at home. This is a little wasp sticking its ovipositor into an aphid where it lays an egg and then the aphid the egg hatches and eats the aphid alive. But one of the stories we developed last year is so, so bad. This is a jewel wasp. And what it does is it uses a cockroach as an incubator and a source of food for its baby. Now obviously cockroaches aren't going to be a willing partner in this. So what the wasp does is it finds a cockroach and it temporarily paralyzes the front pair of legs for about a minute and a half. And while it's the cockroach, cockroaches can run at eight metres a second. They've got these huge escape reflexes and they're just off. So it's paralysed for a minute and a half. Then the wasp goes in to the back of the head 
and it targets two parts of the wasp's brain and injects venom into those parts. And that causes three changes in the wasp. It loses the will to walk. Totally capable of walking, it can't be bothered. It lowers its metabolism, so it's more likely to survive what it's about to go through. And then it starts grooming excessively. It's just covering, cleaning itself all over. While it's doing that, the wasp goes off to look for a nest, comes back, chews off one of the cockroach's antennae, checks the concentration of the venom, it doesn't want it walking off, then it leads it like a dog on a leash, because a cockroach can walk, into the nest and lays an egg on it. That egg hatches and the, the, what, the wasp leaves and seals up, the, seals up the nest. The egg hatches, burrows into the cockroach's body and eats it alive. But it eats it alive to keep it alive as long as possible. So it eats all the non-essential organs. And it, it, because it's a race against time, if the cockroach dies too early, the larvae won't be big enough to pupate and become a wasp. So it keeps it alive. It also produces an antimicrobial that targets a bacteria that targets the cockroach to keep everything as clean as possible. And finally, the um, cockroach dies, the wasp eats the rest, the wasp larvae eats the rest of it, then it pupates, and a month later, this is actually how Weta did it, you can see the brain being lit up on the right and the wasp doing the brain surgery. And this brain surgery is a stinger that's a twentieth of a millimetre across. It's finer than anything people could do with human brain surgery. And it's very specific, and the reason they know this is they made the wasps, this work was mostly done in Israel, and they made the wasps radioactive. And then they could see the parts of the brain that were hot, and then they could see that it was targeting pits of the brain. And then they could analyse the venom and go, well, it's doing this, this, and this. And a month later, this is um, drawn, obviously, a month later, the wasp emerges from the body of the cockroach, opens the nest, goes off to look for a cockroach. <laughs> Just one more story, equally extraordinary, and equally, again, it's, it's, it's understood because of technology and because of, of changes in our ability to look at animals. Quivering balls of death, um, you know, this, the, the, this was in a lavender bush at home, my wife was reading on the deck and suddenly a whole swarm of bees arrived. And they look, I took the photo, took this photograph, but this one at the top looks like they're all praying to it at the bottom. <laughs> the, the worst enemy of Japanese honeybees are giant hornets. And these things are five times the size of a honeybee. And hornets, they normally forage on their own. And they normally, um, you know, just capture bugs and take them back to the hornet babies. But if they come across a, a honeybee nest, they leave a marker pheromone, a chemical, to tell other hornets to join in. Because if you get a critical mass of hornets, about 20 or 30 of them, they can take out 30,000 bees in three hours. They just tear them apart. And then they take all the bee babies back to the hornet babies and feed them. So Japanese honeybees have evolved a way of taking out the scout hornet. So he, he, he comes in. I think it's a he or she. He comes in. He leaves this pheromone to tell the other hornets. The bees near the front of the hive recognise that alarm pheromone and go, oh my God, is one of these things have arrived. And about a hundred bees rush out towards the hornet. And then they rush back in and the hornet follows them. Then they release, the bees release a second pheromone. This time a thousand bees come out. But they can't sting, bite, strangle. They can't kill the hornet in a way you would think. What they do is they detach their flight muscle. They detach their wings from their flight muscles. And then they collectively, a ball of bees over the hornet, all start vibrating their flight muscles. And the lethal temperature for the hornet is about two degrees less than the bees. So they cook it. <laughs> and when they, they kill it, and then they go and mop up the pheromone, and if they can take out that scout, they can stop a full-on attack and save the hive. If you have European honeybees in Japan, they just all get taken out. They haven't evolved that defence. And there's a ball of bees. One of the other things we're not good at is understanding the size of the universe. And go back, you know, three or four hundred years, people sort of thought they could touch the stars. And uh, this is quite a good way of just how big, this is a really big place. This is Durham Cathedral, and it's about twice the size of Christchurch Cathedral. If you went inside Durham Cathedral and held up a grain of rice, 
then the volume of that cathedral is equivalent, if the grain of rice was the earth, the volume inside that cathedral is the size of our solar system. If you held up a grain of rice to represent our solar system, you need 1,500 cathedrals to represent the size of the Milky Way. That's just our galaxy. And if you held up a grain of rice as the Milky Way, then Durham Cathedral again becomes the known universe. Absolutely extraordinary. We've got a spaceship that le left um, Earth in 1976, I think, and is now on the edge of the solar system. It's going to take 75 I think it's either 75 or 125,000 years for that to reach the closest star four light years away. If we could travel at the speed of light, which we probably can't, it still takes, that travelling at the speed of light takes two million years to get to the closest galaxy. And maybe we will never travel at the speed of light. This is what would happen if a baseball player could throw a baseball at 90% of the speed of light instantly. We have the disintegrating picture of the unsuspecting batter, and this is after 30 nanoseconds. Basically what would happen is there would be a mushroom cloud over the town where the baseball game was happening. So there may be constraints in what we can do. Now as Albert Einstein said, only two things are infinite, the universe and human stupidity, and I'm not sure about. The thing is, I, don't, I think he was referring to the fact that people made bombs. I don't think he was meaning collectively people are stupid. Um, and this is Einstein. This is actually the Hubble telescope in the Wilson Observatory in California. And um, I visited there once, and I couldn't... I said this was Hubble, did all the work in the 1920s, and I couldn't believe he chose such an incredibly uncomfortable-looking chair. It's a wooden chair that you think you'd see in a, in a school for bad children. <coughs> And one of the things that science does, that pseudoscience does, is it's very self-regulating. This is, yeah, I think you should be more explicit here in step two, you know, pages of equations, then a miracle occurs, and then we're on to the next thing. One of the things also that, you know, we, we a lot of you here, and, and I was, you know, we all went through the Canterbury earthquakes and, and survived, but I was amazed at the anti-science rhetoric around what GNS were trying to do. And I don't tend to read the comments after articles, but occasionally I would. And it would be, what do these people know? You know, they can put somebody on the moon, they can't cure the cold. How can they predict? They're not predicting earthquakes. They're saying, this is a probability that this may happen. And I think they did an incredibly good job. And they said, no, this was a predictable sequence. And also, every earthquake's different. It's same rhetoric came with the Kaikoura earthquake. They go, something like 20 faults went off. Oh, what do they know? How did they not have all the faults named? Well, they didn't know they were there. Why should they know they were there? Homeopathy is a very good example of something so distant from what we do now. Now, before I say anything else, often homeopathy works. People go to a homeopath. They come home, they take the stuff, they get better. It's just not for the reasons that they're told. If you took a glass of water the size of the, un the solar system and you dropped a grain of something in there and then took a wee vial, that's the dilution. Their argument is that there's a memory of that molecule that somehow goes through your digestive system and cures you. There's no, it's biologically implausible, chemistry it's implausible, physics is implausible because it was based on understanding of chemistry 200 years ago. And that's a very common feature of pseudoscience, is it will say that whoever it was knew about the healing powers of crystals for 3,000 years, or something else. And I'll get back to that in just a minute. One of the things that medicine does is often double-blind tests. So the person giving the drug and getting it doesn't know if they're getting a placebo or the real effect. And the placebo effect is incredibly strong. There was a very nice study done on the healing powers of crystals. So they got two groups, and they gave one group real so-called healing power crystals, and the other ones had fake crystals that didn't, weren't meant to have any healing powers. And then they made the people meditate for five minutes, and then describe, did the crystal make you feel better, did it do anything? Both groups agreed the crystals made them feel better, even though ones weren't real. And, and basically people said, well look, if, that, if crystals make you feel better, that's fine. Wear them, stick them in your pocket. 
doesn't matter, has no consequences. Their only caution to that was they said, don't put crystals around a child's neck, because they might strangle themselves. Now, double-blind tests do have limitations, and I'll, this is an example. One of the things I want, I want to give you some examples of, of, of some of the strategies of pseudoscience, and, but I also want to say science changes, our, under, our understanding of the world changes, and, and what we know about our, how our bodies work, what we know about how medicine works, all these things change dramatically. But Carl Sagan said, you know, we live in a society exquisitely dependent on science and technology, which hardly anybody knows anything about science and technology. And I think that's very true. Anti-vax movement in the US, you know, down, get rid of measles now to increase. I'm sure these things will cycle around. People look for causation. They go, well, my child developed autism at one and a half, and that was when I took the vaccine, therefore these things are linked. And medicine is bent over backwards to show there is no link. This, some of you here, and I, I'm included, will remember having the polio vaccine in, in New Zealand in the 1960s as a drink. The reason I show you this is, an epidemiologist in the US was talking to a group of young mums in their 20s and 30s that were tertiary educated that were having their first child. So he was talking about the importance of vaccinations. And he thought he'd start historically, so he talked about the polio vaccine. And the wo a woman amongst this group stood up and said, why are you talking about shirts? <laughs> and the thing was, his point was, maybe we did our job too well. She'd never heard of polio. She heard of polo shirts. <laughs> As a spider biologist, I get, used to get endless phone calls about white-tailed spiders. We all have opinions about them. They've been in New Zealand 100 years. They're no worse than any other spider. There were two independent studies done, one in Australia, one in New Zealand. Australia, 130 confirmed white-tailed bites, no worse than a bee sting and none of the stuff where your arm falls off and whatever. But I, and I would say to people, did you, did you feel it bite? No. Did you see it bite? No. Well, how do you know it was a whitetail? Well, I saw one in the garden last week. I mean, believe me, if you're bitten by a spider, you will know. And it would wake you up in the middle of the night. But still they'd say to me, no, no, but my friend's arm fell off. And I said, well, yeah, it may not have been because of a whitetail. Lots of other things can cause infections. And this is sort of how I see, you know, you want to be diplomatic. People are genuinely concerned that, that a white tail may have done the damage it did. And I feel like this a bit, you know, innocence on the bicycle of propriety, carrying the urn of reputation, safe over the abyss of indiscretion. So you walk a fine line. You don't want people to go away feeling stupid. And this is, again, what people realise with talking about science, whether you're talking about vaccinations or you're talking about evolution and biology. If they don't believe it, nothing you will say will change their thinking. They will just dig their heels in. And what they found with the anti-vax movement in the US, what is changing people's thinking is don't try to tell them the science. Say, this is what happens when you don't vaccinate. And they'll show a history of this person's child could not have this vaccination because of this congenital problem, and they died because somebody else at their school didn't have the vaccination. That type of thing works with people. Now, science is a long history of learning how not to fool ourselves. We look back, you know, imagine going back to a hut. Imagine if somebody said, you've got the option of going to a GP who only practices what was known in 1917. You know, would you go? I mean, I've seen instruments from the 1930s in medical museums. But, so things change. And I just want to show you some advertisements that reflect those changes. And also reflect that people still sell snake oil and have done for hundreds of years. You know, doctors sell cigarettes. <laughs> and this is referring to, to cigarettes, not the animal. More doctors smoke camels than the other cigarette. And this is actually from the 1970s. Blow in her face and she'll follow you anywhere. You just see that happening now. Now, notice the prevalence of smoking. This is taken in 1959. And we had the workers to the left of the tall man in the middle, and management to the right. 
So the workers are a bit scruffy. The guy that, on the left is probably hiding a cigarette behind him. But I like the contrast between the, the next person and the one with his, you know, holding the cigarette and his handkerchief and parted hair, etc. People used to smoke. My parents smoked. Frighteningly, that's my grandfather in the middle, 1959, and he's a year younger than I am now, which is very frightening. <laughs> Make children adults as fat as pigs with Grove's tasteless <coughs> chilled tonic. <laughs> and, you know, we get similar things. She's wearing Simpson iodine locket, and she's immune to practically everything. <laughs> this one was a bit of a mystery to me. I haven't quite... Um, understood what was being sold, Paige Woodcock's wind pills, <laughs> whether they cause wind or reduce wind, it's not clear. And she's not really giving you any idea. <laughs> the curves of youth. It, it faces double chins, it reduces enlarged glands, a constant problem. Um, yes. And we've all seen this type of stuff. I, I, this one I wish I'd have when I'm doing my PhD. <laughs> Cures excessive study mania and over brain work. <laughs> now, the thing is, th these are funny because they're historically funny and we know they're not true. This is a 2014 ad for Harmonise Water. This is water that's got energy imprints in it. And it's $60 a bottle and it cures practically everything. When you read what it does, the propriety neo-homeopathic synthesis utilises aspects of traditional homeopathy, Malcolm Ray's magnetogeometric methods and scalar non-radionic cloning. <laughs> but it also stimulates the vital force and it is the strength of the vital force that ultimately determines a man's sexual potency. So you're just covering everything. <laughs> and, but, this is in the States does not actually contain any physical drug material like vague, blah, blah, blah. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. <laughs> this product is for experimentation and research purposes only. Isn't that shocking? But people buy it. Now, I guess the question, and we'll have time for questions, is maybe, well, how do you, how do you tell if you're not a scientist whether this is rubbish or not? And I think you go online and you look at reputable sites. Increasingly, scientists are saying, no, it is our responsibility to, to expose charlatans. You know, this is a paper on homeopathy. A model for homeopathic remedy effects. Low-dose nanoparticles, allostatic cross-adaptation, time-dependent sensitization complex. Absolute garbage. And it's in a journal that's absolute garbage. But would you know? I mean, to me, it, if I wasn't, I'd say, well, that sounds like, you know, they really know what they're doing. I've come up with my one. Simon's magic ice cubes are harmonised with synaptic neurotransmitters from suboxone pharyngeal ganglion using neo <laughs> frequencies. <laughs> so, I'm selling it at the end of the talk, too. <laughs> the first part refers to how nerves talk to each other, how nerve impulses go from one nerve to another with, with synaptic neurotransmitters. Suboxone pharyngeal ganglion is part of an insect brain. And the Group Banana Rama from the 1980s are getting back together at the end of the year and singing. So there are the neo Banana Rama frequencies. And that is shocking. That's my favourite badly stuffed animal. You believe this will rejuvenate people? Main thing is to make the buyer believe. If it's too good to be true, it probably is. If you read something that has 30 cures, really. Now, some of you will have been aware of Gwyneth Paltrow's goop site. It's just frightening. And it's frightening because it makes people scared. And this woman, Jen, J-E-N, Gunter, G-U-N-T-E-R, is a gynaecologist in San Francisco. She's originally from Canada. And she is going after this type of pseudoscience. And she's very articulate. And she said, you know, it was the Woodstock pseudoscience, that Woodstock was free. The, Goop just sells ridiculous things. They had patches that they said NASA used, and I can't even remember what they did, but they cured everything, and NASA said, no, that, take that off, and they take it off. You know, when a man, this is from 1931, tells you that he knows the exact truth about anything, you're safe in inferring he is an exact, inexact person, man. And we do make mistakes. 
How's the Psalms title page coming along, brother? <laughs> um, probably been working on it for two years. Now, I want to give you an example of how science checks itself. Pseudoscience doesn't. Pseudoscience, no, well, that's not right. You can't say that. A few years ago, people thought that they'd discovered neutrinos that were travelling faster than the speed of light. They were in a particle uh, detector going 730 k's from Switzerland to Italy. And the particles, the results showed that they were travelling 0.002% faster than the speed of light and arriving at their destination 60 nanoseconds earlier. Suddenly, 100 years of physics was about to go down a black hole because could this travel faster than the speed of light? It turned out that it was a faulty fibre optics cable. Now, I'm probably simplifying this enormously because um, that's what I read. But then they redid it. No, they weren't going faster than the speed of light. They have five different particle detectors in Switzerland, and in, in, I can't remember, it's the opera. Um, they tested neutrinos to each of these to make sure. So they checked and then we, no, we're all safe. No, this did not go fast in the speed of light. We're not rewriting the last 100 years of physics. The thing that was good about this is a really good joke came out of it. <laughs> Well, it was, it was worth the experiment. <laughs> so how do, we, how do we differentiate between science and pseudoscience? Well, I know we don't all, not everybody has access to ac academic journals, but reading science sites, often when they say new, you know, new discovery, they'll cite the paper. I read The Guardian, The Washington Post, and The New York Times every day, and they've got fantastic science sites, and they'll say a new discovery, um, you know, dual wasp, does this new venom found, and then they'll cite the original. Ac the academic journal is where it's peer reviewed, where it's gone out. Not a pseudoscience journal, a recognised journal that somebody will read that and say, No, you've made a mistake, you've assumed this, or you didn't get this right, or why have you only got a sample size of one? As you go down the list, you know, YouTube comments, uh, comment newspaper, popular books. People can write books about anything. Doesn't necessarily mean that what they're saying is credible. I just want to tell you a couple more stories um, about why science is so much fun. And you know this, the most exciting phrase here in science, the one that helps you discovery is not Eureka. You know the light going on, it's, oh I didn't expect that. It's like, was it um, Fleming puts the penicillin with the thing and he comes back the next day and they're all dead? Didn't expect that to happen. That was actually quite good that he came back. Um, and this is again, uh, you remember Watson and Crick discovered and with woman Francis, I can't remember his surname, um, discovered the structure of DNA. Yeah. Yes, Frank, thank, thank you, Frank, Rosalind Franklin. Yeah. Um, so this was, this is actually a New Zealand cartoonist. It says, Cambridge 1953, shortly after discovering the structure of DNA, Watson and Crick, depressed by the lack of progress, visit the local pub. And this is a very nice quote from Stephen Hawking. The bearers of the torch of discovery in our quest for knowledge. And I just want to finish with, this is, to me is a fantastic story of bringing science to life, really. Werner Forsman, German, training as a cardiologist. And he knew about the fact that you could catheterize horses where you would introduce a tube into the jugular vein and take it down into the heart. And you could do that on a horse. And he was convinced that if you did it on a person, then it would be a way of measuring blood pressure more uh, precisely. It would be a way of introducing drugs. He wasn't allowed to do it. He was a trainee, a 25-year-old training as a, as a cardiologist. So he tricked the nurse who was head of the operating theatre when there was an hour break that he would do this and could she help him. And she said, I'll only do it if you allow to do it on me because then I might become part of medical history. So he goes in there and he pretends that he's going to do it on her. And he ties it down, so, you know, I'm going to put the local anesthetic, and then he does it on himself. And so he walks then 
up, so he's got the tube almost in, so it's down to about here, and then he walks up to the x-ray department, and he stands in front of the x-ray, then he pushes it down into the right atrium of his heart, and takes the photograph. So he showed that you could do this on self-catheterisation in people, and of course now it's just so routine. Now he got into a lot of trouble, and then they finally said you can't be a cardiologist behaving like that, you can be a urologist, so he trained to be a urologist, then he joined the Nazi party, then he um, got captured by the Americans, was a prisoner of war, and while he was a prisoner of war, Americans were reading the paper he wrote about this process. And then after the war he was a lumberjack, because he couldn't be a doctor, then he became a GP, then he went back to being a urologist. And in 1956 he shared the Nobel Prize. And he said, somebody said, what are you going to do with the money? He said, well now I can uh, buy 25 cent cigars instead of 10 cent cigars. <laughs> And then he became, you know, all this stuff. But isn't it a fantastic story of self-discovery? And he died of heart failure. That's the other thing. <laughs> it may have been died of cigars, I don't know. Okay, I just, the last thing I want to say, just 45 minutes. Maybe a lot of what, what is an issue for us is we're not very good at handling our own biology and mortality. You know, we'd like to live forever. And it seems unfair that we're finite. This is actually one of the last remaining... Um, sculptures that didn't fall over in the earthquake in the Sydenham Cemetery. And you know, heavy home road, no exit, that really sums up life. Um, <laughs> and we don't know how long we've got. <laughs> this, this is from a 1953 Health for Canadians book. What should this man learn about cleaning a gun? Um, my wife's Canadian, so I, she's... I know I don't have guns anyway. Um, I think. Oh, this again. He alive, Charlotte Eves, died October 27, 1881. She lived each day as if it were her last, especially this one. <laughs> That's reminding you of your mortality. But I, when I was in Canada recently with Cynthia, I, well, I, I like taking pictures in cemeteries, and this was a woman who died in 58, but there's a buried communication cable, which does make me feel very optimistic. And Finally, you know, faith is a fine invention when gentlemen can see that microscopes are prudent in an emergency. <laughs> and I just, this is just to me fantastic. This reflects, it's 2017, and all of the science and technology we have, both for looking after ourselves and for looking after the planet and for understanding the planet. And this is the Earth and the Moon taken through the rings of Saturn, the photograph. And it makes us, one, feel quite insignificant and realise this is where we live. We were all doing something when that photograph was taken. <coughs> the final thing I want to show you, I think it's the next one, this is a very humble, it was sent to me recently, I say it's a very humbling theological typograph. So thank you very much. Um, I think we've got time for questions. And I just remind you, um, UC Connect, that if you register, then you can come to other lectures. Um, and that's the details for doing that. So thank you very much. And uh, yeah. Bye.